I know we have a comment here. Would, do you want to say something? Yes? Is this on? Yeah. Thank you very much. I might have a question for the last presenter. You, uh, you very nice presentation, by the way. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that there were 17 issues that the men uh, typically commented on as problematic. I was wondering if you could comment on the nature of those 17 points, not maybe all of them, but and uh -huh. my question is, are you as a physician able to solve those 17 questions or are they perhaps, uh, would they be important for some other profession? Uh, of course. What we actually, when we, when we had interviewed both patients and also doctors and nurses, it ended up in a validated questionnaire. It's the EORTC QLQ C15, actually the uh, palliative uh, version of this questionnaire. So uh, some of the problems I can absolutely solve as a prof professional, if it's a pain uh, situation or nausea or so, but if I need, of course, I take uh, other professionals, physiotherapists, uh, uh, psychologists, and so if needed. And, and I think the, the good thing, because of course the patient can mention all other problems too, but these, it, it saves time and it, um, a lot of these questions, all patients come with long lists with different systems. Then we can focus in a completely different way now. So it's, uh, and it's also a nice way because we can follow up the effect on um, symptoms and quality of life of all these new treatments. Greg, you heard this presentation. What do you think about it? I mean, the difference between Nigeria and Sweden, for example, when it comes to possibilities to be a part. Well, um, I happen to work uh, in the next office to someone who's working with the Abraj group to put cancer centers in developing countries where they have recently put hospitals, including Nigeria. And I, I, was, I was hoping he could be here, but he's in the Middle East at the moment. But it's interesting that some things are better in Africa than the United States, like the take up of the HPV vaccine is higher in Kenya than it is in the United States. Um, and I think that the, uh, the distribution of knowledge and healthcare uh, vary by population in every country. Uh, in the United States, so many men will do radical treatments who could live with their cancer, but they're so frightened by their cancer that they, they don't live the life they want to live. As you said, what do you want to do? They live the life they think they have to live, and that's a, that's a shame. Uh, I, I was very impressed about your analogy that um, the, the, the patient who uh, doesn't understand the health system and biology is going to first go by belief instead of by science. Uh, this is, uh, I can see why this would be a very troubling issue in Nigeria. It is also a troubling issue in the United States. The reason people don't get the HPV vaccine is because they believe it represents promiscuity, not cancer vaccines. So the religious right says this vaccine means your children will have sex. And I tell people, because I've met young people who've had full hysterectomies in their 20s from cervical cancer that could have been prevented with this vaccine. So I admire very much what you're doing. And I, I, I hope that we can um, provide uh, the community outreach that lets people know that there's hope uh, and that their health isn't a matter of belief, but it's a matter of observation and community, okay. right? If the pastor, uh, in the United States, we often say women are the doctors of the world because they're the doctors of every family. So if you don't convince the woman that her family needs to get checkups and that her husband needs to get checkups, then it's very difficult for that to happen. And I assume in Nigeria, it's even more of a problem because of the stigma of cancer. In the US, we have stigma around lung cancer because people say you deserve it because you smoked. This is outrageous. But in some cultures, just being sick is a stigma. And, and I, 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 I am very empathetic with the challenge you have. 
I wanted to ask, thank you, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Marie, would a register like this be possible in Ireland, for example? Um, a re the register that... Um, the that the yeah, the prostate the cancer. Uh, there's talk of it. Um, I mean, we are at early stage and we're talking about it. Um, it will happen. It's just happening like so many things in healthcare, it's happening too slowly for us, but it is it is being talked about. We have an e-health strategy, and this is part of the discussion as well. But again, it's just so frustrating that things move so slowly. They move slowly. We talk about the patient's involvement. Some places we don't drive, we don't know how to drive the nice car. And here, uh, could it be too much involvement of the patients? Um, are you asking me? me? Me I ask both you, uh, all of you, uh, just pick up the, yeah. I, I think that, sorry. sorry, I think these are the conversations that we need to have, and I think Could you talk into the microphone, please? I'm speaking into the microphone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, super. Uh, these are the conversations we need to have, because we're, the, the problem is, actually, um, Kalichi, you mentioned Chimamanda, I've actually quoted her before, and she talks about, um, story and stereotype and the problem with if we have one story so if we have one story of the patient and we just label it as one patient or we have one story as the doctor this is a big problem so we need to start recognizing that there are so more than just one story um, so these are the conversations that we need to be having because i think the big problem is when we say all patients or all doctors this is what's stopping us progressing in some ways i think I, just a moment, Ingela, do you, do you, I, I do you ever feel like it's great that we are all very engaged in our future and in your job, but could it be too much? Could no, it be a down? I don't think side? so, because there is a lack of patient involvement. And my experience, are, experience is uh, working with this now for five years. It's, it's just amazing, because they need to be, all our patients, they need to be there from the start. Otherwise, we will run away in a complete wrong direction, maybe. Okay, without the patients, you're uh, in the wrong direction. Yes? Yeah. Misinformation runs and truth walks. So you, you often find that people will grab on to false hope and you need patients themselves to talk to those people. That's really critical because they're already skeptical of authority. At least in the United States, they're skeptical of authority. They think drug companies are hiding the cure. The doctors are only want to see you for 10 minutes. So I, I, I know both cases. I, I know a woman we put on stage with President Obama when he signed the 21st Century Cures Act, which gave the moonshot money, who was sent home to die from Sloan Kettering. And her sister, not her doctor, found a trial online at Johns Hopkins that saved her life. And now she's a healthy 26-year-old woman three years later. At the same time, as you can imagine, we get a lot of incoming of people with brain cancer. And we try to give them advice, uh, directing them toward doctors who can help because I'm not a doctor but they will email me every day with I found an article that says this is the cure and then you'll read the article and it's a trial with 50 people that's way early to say that it's going to work in anybody else and and it's very difficult to walk them back but that's our obligation as patients is to bring people back to reality that it's not going to be a miracle in most cases it's going to be hard work Kelechi, when you hear about a lot of involvements, both in Ireland and Sweden and, and also in the US, what do you think is needed for the case of Nigeria to get to the next step, to be a part of this? Well, the first thing we need to do is to increase education of patients and of doctors as well, because we don't know enough that we should know in the, at the primary care level in Nigeria to be able to give the patients what's available locally. You know, for instance, someone needs a biopsy and can't get it because the doctor doesn't know how to do it mm. or doesn't think it's necessary. You know, there are a lot of issues in the system. And from the patient's perspective, sometimes there might be a little bit too much of information that people get, or too much of a, um, not too much information, but too much rights. For instance, in the issue of cervical cancer, if it was mandated, like people could have eradicated smallpox because of the vaccination. And we know, like from the WHO push recently, that we can eradicate most of several cancer if we all had the vaccine. So why not make it like smallpox? 
But of course, anti-vaxxers will say no, and they go to Dr. Google and come back to you and say, well, it's my right, it's my information. I get to choose. So sometimes Education. having that choice isn't really very good at some point. Ingel, at last, uh, when is, what is the next step? What big registry will we have after this one? Uh, uh, now it's for advanced cancer, but we're going to expand this now from diagnosis to cure or death, so we get the whole picture. But the key is that we want this for all tumor types. And the good thing, because the medical record systems are lousy in Sweden, and this uh, here we specify how, how we would like to collect data in a systematic way that are good both for patients and for doctors and for policymakers. So, so to expand it to other tumor types, that's the next step. We're going to do that. Thank you very much, Marie, Ingla, Kelechi, Greg. Thank you very much, everyone. A big applaud. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.